Hi, everyone. This is Alan McKay, and welcome to episode 145. I'm speaking with one of the founders of Halon, Brad Alexander. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, welcome to a brand new episode. So quickly, before we dive into this, I just want to quickly mention that there's a couple more days left for the free plasma training that I've put out. This is a free seven video course spanning over eight hours. We get into a lot of visual effects simulations, a lot of really cool stuff. So this is available until June 24th. After that, it's going back in the vault. So that being said, if you want to sign up, quickly go to alanmckay.com slash plasma to sign up there. And if you're listening to this after the date, you can still go there to sign up and you'll get notification of the next round of free training that I put out. Uh, I'm actively trying to put out a lot of content, usually 50 to 100 hours of free training every single year. So there's always new content coming out. Okay, so that being said, I'm really excited for this episode. I chat with Brad Alexander, one of the founders of Halon. They do a lot of really amazing previs and production work as well. Everything from video games like God of War all the way through to feature films like Meg, Pacific Rim, Cloverfield, Star Wars, lots of other stuff like that. So this episode is going to be a lot of fun to get into. One thing I want to also mention is that Brad is going to be at Comic-Con, which is coming up pretty soon. He'll be there on the Saturday for Pacific Rim, along with Peter Chang. You can keep an eye out for him there. So that'll be really cool to check that out. I'll definitely leave information in the show notes about this if you want to find out more. I've never been to Comic-Con. I've always wanted to go. I think it'd be a a blast to attend, but uh, I won't be going. But if you are in San Diego, make sure to go say hi to Brad and mention that you listen to the podcast. I'm sure you'd get a kick out of that. Now, I want to get right into this podcast. We get into a lot of different stuff. And I think just in general, hearing Brad's story, as well as everything he's accomplished now, owning as a partner, a very successful visual effects studio in LA, as well as his charisma, everything that he brings to this episode, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think that you'll get a lot from it. So that being said, let's dive in. Yeah, totally. No, so basically, uh, you know, I I grew up in pretty much in the South, and I joined the Air Force, and then when I was in the Air Force, I kind of figured out, I, I, you know, I've always been an artist, I've been drawing since I was like five, and I've always loved technology, and I kind of put two and two together when I was in the Air Force, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go to film school, but before I went to film school, I kind of taught myself Maya back and forth, and then I ended up kind of sort of teaching the teachers a little bit when I was in school, yep. didn't, gra- didn't graduate. Uh, ended up getting hired by George Lucas to work on the prequels of Star Wars 2 and 3. And then uh, we left. Uh, I met my business partner there. We came down uh, to L.A. We started Halon Entertainment about 15 years ago. And mm-hmm. then we've just been cranking out movies since. <laughs> no, that's super cool. And I was just curious about that, too. Like, was that for Jack Films or which division? It, it was. It was Jack Films. It, after Named after George's kids. Jet, yep. Amanda, Katie. Yep. That's right. And yeah. That- it's funny because I was actually meant to work on Attack of the Clones because uh, at one point, because it was all being, a lot of it was being shot in Sydney in Australia. And um, yeah. so yeah, at one point they were looking at uh, doing all the previews down there and I was going to come on board for that. And for me at the time, previews was kind of, previews and Maya especially, because I think back then I was, I was back, both Max and Maya, but yeah, I was going to go and jump on that project and very last minute they're like, all right, plans change now. Jack is going to handle the whole thing. And um, yeah, yeah. You know, you, we don't Sorry. need you anymore. <laughs> So it's all Sorry, your fault. <laughs> were you are, were you ever on IRC at all ever? Oh, it's so weird because I was just um I was in Vegas over the weekend. I organized like a bit of a business retreat with other artists. Actually, uh, one of them was one of the directors at Lucasfilm, and um yeah, we ended up by talking about that because I, I used to be on Fnet on like 3ds Max and other same channels. year. Wait, what was your name? <laughs> this exact conversation I just had. Uh, Machete, I think it was back then. Dude, you're Machete. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. I'm I was I'm Fusion VFX. Oh no way! Holy crap! Yeah, yeah. Man, it's so funny that you know 
Yeah, because like it was just so funny for, for me, especially because I always look back and I never really had any mentors or anyone to look up to. And then finally, yeah. I think it's just recently I kind of realized, well, wait a minute, like I did have a back then yeah. and it was, you know, Fnet. And we had everyone from like Adam Barrity, Stefan Didak, yeah. like Brandon Davis, um, uh, Marcos, who wrote Arnold. Like there was so yeah. much amazing talent in that chat room, totally. you know. And yeah, I oh. totally remember you now. Holy crap. Small that world. is amazing, dude. Oh my gosh. And it's like number one lesson is like always use your real name because otherwise you're going to be using multiple identities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should cool. put it on my business card. EFnet, Fusion, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just really funny because like, um, yeah, I, I honestly feel like there's so much talent that, you know, in 1997, oh, 98, God. 99, even before that, it was just... Um, well, that yeah. was like the birth of the technology that mm -hmm. gave us the... Uh, ability to get what's in our heads out the fastest you know it's like maya like the thing with maya when it was like at its, in, at its conception was like it, the ergonomics of using the controls to like model something as fast as you can with sculpting it, that was revolutionary mm -hmm. you know yeah you couldn't that back with, then you that was unheard of you know to you couldn't do that with power animator you know and when i mm -hmm. came around i'm like oh my god and now you've got zbrush where you literally can you know have full-on like contact sculpting where in vr it's it's insane yeah no, it's it's so cool, and it's yeah, it's such a small world like that. So uh, yeah, and anyway, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, yeah, I mean, just to jump around a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, for you, so joining the Air Force, like, and then wanting to do film, like, when did you kind of get that aha moment that you're like, hey, you know, I want to you know, make films and kind of uh, completely shift. Oh man, like it was like it was a really really big uh, decision because when I was in the uh, military, you were, you were in Top Gun, you had one of the those uh, wasn't a MIG, what was it? <laughs> no. you know, Tom Cruise was, was giving you the bird. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I worked on uh, weapon systems for F-15 and A-10s, so I was pretty much everything from the pylons and the missiles all the way to the cockpit, and I had to do all the wiring and stuff. Which you know it was fine and stuff, but then I was like, you know. I'm here in Vegas and, you know, b being in the military gave me time to like sit back and think like, what do you really, tr what do you truly love in your life? And for me, it was like, I love technology and I love art. Me and how beer, do I put Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I put them together and it was like, you know, it's, you know, I started learning how to model, you know, and well, it didn't even start there. It was Photoshop. I did like a lot of rave flyers in like Vegas because I was stationed. <laughs> at, I was stationed at Nellis when I was in Vegas. And so I did a lot of rave flyers and then I was like, oh, wow, I learned Lightwave and I was like, holy crap. And I figured out how to like uh, do 3D modeling. And then I was like, wait a second, there's a community for this. And I found uh, EFNet. That's when I was on IRC. I was like, oh, my gosh. And I met all these people that, you know, shared the same interest. And then I was like, uh, I think Alias Alias Wavefront at the time came to Vegas and they did this whole unveiling of uh, Maya with Bingo the Clown. And it was like <laughs> so cool. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. So I made a decision and I was like, you know what? I don't want to stay in Vegas because everyone that stays in Vegas basically ends up either being a car dealer, homeless, or it's or working like, under a bridge. <laughs> we're working under a bridge yeah it's just shady you know and i just wanted to do something for, with my life that was like you know i want to put my passion into it i want to be happy when i come home from work every night mm -hmm. and the only way i can possibly do that is doing something i love and you know when you're actually making cool things and contributing to like a beautiful vision like to me it's just it's inspiration you know and i live for that that's so cool that's really cool um yeah i mean especially back then I, I, going back to bingo for a second and um <laughs> I'm kind of afraid to watch that again because in my mind oh, it, it was God. it looked so good and I'm I'm afraid to yeah. go back now and be like oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best was after I saw Bingo. I went to like Sigraph two years after and I got to sit down and have a beer with Chris Landreth and I was like oh my gosh, I'm sitting with Chris Landreth. He's like oh my god, <laughs> like the dude. <laughs> it was so awesome. But that's cool. But, yeah. And I guess for you, like when did you? officially make the transition having that spark but then falling through so and i basically i was married at the time uh, i married a showgirl it was very interesting uh and i was like you know i gotta go to school and my plan was is let me get through school so i can establish myself in this industry well in my progress that didn't quite work out on that marriage end but i ended up not finishing school but getting hired by george lucas mm. to work on the star wars prequels and that is when pretty much everything started to open up but how did that happen? Actually, just to segue for a second, um, I'm not sure if you know this, my fiance, she, she's Canadian, but um, can't hold that against her. But um, <laughs> she, yeah, it's just kind of funny because I did an interview with her 
episode 99 and uh, just kind of talking about her and like wanting to be an artist and her both her parents were in the military and yeah. she kind of went back and forth with her passion being art and design and then at the same time you know her parents always saying like get a real career you know get a real job oh, and oh my gosh you have no idea oh my god oh there i have a good story here you're gonna like this one yeah so in my when i went to when i decided to go to school i decided to go to full sale which is in florida mm-hmm. and that's when i got serious and i that's what i left vegas to go to and i went Ryan Connolly to, did the same thing directly yeah yeah full, yeah full so yeah i went there and there was a class and in that class the class was so is set up a mock resume set up a demo reel and but you're, we're not going to send it out. It's just going to be practice. But meanwhile, for the past like year and a half before, I've already been creating all of this work. Like, you know, I had so much to do. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm just going to I got home from class one day and I'm like, I'm just going to start looking at some ads online and just seeing what's out there. And there was a blind ad. Um, well, basically in the project, it was like you have to figure out your dream job, where you want to go, what you want to do, what, we, what you want to work on and what you want to do. Well, mine was to work on Star Wars. I didn't care how where, when it was, uh, live in San Rafael, California. And I was like, all right, well, that was my whole thing. So I had, uh, there was a blind ad that came out and it was like, uh, looking for VFX artists for high profile feature film, blah, blah, blah. It was a blind ad. There was nothing else attached to it. Yeah. Cause you put Star Wars in that thing. Like, <laughs> well, I, no, I just the mail. I no, no, I'm just saying that if you, sorry to cut you off. I was going to say if, if you, if they advertise Star Wars on the thing or something like that, like clog the mail, I'm sure. Oh, Oh yeah, of course it would break their service probably, but like they, uh, I was like, Oh, I sent this thing off and I was like, whatever, here's some of my work. They're not going to say anything. I'm just, you know, I'm like, I'm not expecting much. And then three days later I get a response and it says, uh, from lucasfilm.com. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And so my heart basically dropped and then I'm like, okay, I need to scrounge up. And they're like, can you be here for an interview? Oh no, sorry, sorry. I skipped a beat, but can you send us a demo reel? <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't have a demo reel. <laughs> so I literally stayed up for like two weeks straight drinking like big gulp 44 iced coffee, just slamming it, making as much as I could. Like I was animating balloons, trying to show like lightweight and like bricks falling and everything. Finally, I send this reel off. I don't hear anything for like two weeks. And then uh, David DeZoritz sent me an email and said, hey, can you be here at Skywalker Ranch on uh, Friday? And it was a Wednesday and I'm a broke student in Florida. <laughs> trying to scrounge up money to get a flight. So I went out, I fly, I get to Skywalker Ranch, driving across the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm crying. I couldn't believe I'm there. And then they basically said, yeah, we want you to start Monday. So I was wow. like, what? So it was like a complete transition. Um, yeah, it was it was insane. And that's where I met my business partner, and that's where we started Halon. Yeah, we want you to start Monday because you took Alan's job. I get it. It's cool. <laughs> 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 no, dude, like that. that's so cool. And like, it's kind of funny that those are always the situations where you do a what if. And I think that a lot of people yeah. are going to do the opposite. They're like, eh, nothing's going to come of this. It's not worth my yeah. my bother. And and that's the thing that's usually like the big life-changing, life-altering uh, event in, in your yeah. career. That's Very so nice. cool. Do you ever uh, wonder like, what if? <laughs> what if I didn't uh, apply? I do actually. You know, I look back and I think of decisions if I wouldn't make, like if I wouldn't try to go for something I wanted to do and I just set back and it's like, I don't know. It's that's kind of it's not in my blood. I just I can't not. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's really cool. Um, actually, I've, I've got an interview coming out with two feature film directors who are buddies of mine, and uh, they got their first movie coming out in August. And it's just funny because I've known them since they were twenty one, and they'd always say that um, they they'd always win all these contests and everything everywhere they go because most people would never apply for them there'd be like a contest in the newspaper or whatever and, and they'd see it and 99 percent of people they see it and be like oh, i'm not gonna win so they don't try so these guys just clean up and win everything because yeah you, know, you got to be in it to win it and with those guys they're they just do it all and because of that yeah. they they win a it's majority amazing. you see the most ambitious projects coming out of just one person these days mm. and then sometimes you see like you know groups of 30 people make something mediocre because they don't put their soul into it that's right and it's like you know, it's, it's crazy. It's super crazy. Um, what I was going to say before was just uh, my fiance ended up uh, to try and make your dad proud, ended up joining the military and she was going to go into the Air Force into weapons tech. And oh, um, wow, that's yeah. exactly what I <laughs> <laughs> So it's just funny, like kind of going that path. But then, uh-huh. you know, I, I think it is one of those kind of course corrections where you keep trying different things, but you know where your heart is. And one way or another, you're going to keep going back to that. So you might as well just do it in the first place, you know, and be obsessed about something. You know, the, the funniest thing about it is one of the 
attributes of being in the military and like being on the flight line every day and watching F-15s, F-16s, A-10s, F-4s, uh, F-22s buzz and just fly around and you see their flight dynamics. Like one of the biggest things we do at Halon is we animate spaceships. Like we're the spaceship guys. Like everyone calls us <laughs> an animated spaceship. But I'm the way I worked on a episode seven and I basically uh, with JJ, I basically sat with him uh, in a room for like three months and just did the entire like desert chase sequence in episode seven with him. And it, all of it, like I go back and I think about like all the flight dynamics that I ever saw. And like, I actually got to go up in an F-15 for an incentive wow. flight. The feeling of being inside and pulling the G's and like, it's really, it's, it's, it was nice to like communicate that in a mm-hmm. artistic form uh, after like being a grunt, you know what I mean? It, yeah. It's kind of crazy. No, that's awesome. And when you're working with JJ, was that, was he working in London remotely or was he down in Cloverfield just down the street from you guys? Oh, both. Uh, we worked with him a lot. Um, so when we were on Star Wars, uh, we started, uh, we were at Bad Robot for probably four or five months. And then I traveled with uh, to London with him. And then as they were shooting, I set up a small previous team and we did a couple of more sequences while we were there. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah it's fun. And it's I full circle, London. you know, like that's the cool yeah. thing. <laughs> that's great. And like, uh, I think it's really awesome, like the, the, the whole kind of segue into it all and for you again I, I always love kind of leaning into those moments because I, I i do think that when you because i actually just interviewed kevin bailey who works oh he, no way I yeah love kevin he's great <laughs> so yeah his first job like you know I, I kind of felt like i have to put a disclaimer with this episode like look this isn't normal that you go from high school to you know sitting yeah, in a room exactly. with george lucas but <laughs> <Totally>. yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's exactly it. He's just like sending his stuff, and it's just coincidentally when they're ramping up for Phantom Menace. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, yeah. totally. Yeah. No, I was right, right behind him, man. That kid was a rock star, and uh, they went on to do the orphanage and stuff. That was amazing. It's that, uh, I was very proud of that guy. Yeah, no, I, I love him, Ryan. In fact, like, yeah, I just realized I had a dream about him and Ryan last night. That's kind of weird. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I um this this weekend I've been away. I was down on. Uh, in LA for a Marvel gig and then I had to go to Vegas and then I got back. So this weekend I promised my uh, Christina I'd, I'd go and just stay in a hotel for a couple of days downtown. And so wait, it's kind of, where, where don't tell me you're at standard. Oh, so uh, no, I, I, I haven't told you this. I'm, I actually just moved to Portland about a year ago. So I'm, I'm actually up, up here. Um, but, but if I was, uh, my staycation locations are always either Sky Bar, like the Mondarian in Hollywood on sunset or yeah, the standard. So it's kind of like, um, you know, do I, do I want to quiet, uh, pool party kind of place so we can walk around and get some good food or do I want to just you know get drunk in a big yeah. <laughs> concrete jungle you know with a good view of other buildings exactly. um, but but yeah it's kind of funny because yeah those two are my kind of go-to places for um you know getting away from Santa Monica for a little bit nice yeah but uh yeah so I've been up in Portland so I just went downtown but is guiltily I I I went out, I think, Saturday morning, and I brought a LiDAR scanner and uh, red um, Epic W as well, and, like, all this film gear, so I just ended up, like, going out and trying to find parking garages I can do some test shooting with. So, oh, that's super cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, anyway, so, yeah, I think it's really awesome, though, like, uh, all, you know, your whole transition in the beginning, and, like, what was it like in your first, you know, during the whole period, like, being at Lucas? Um, It was amazing, you know, I pretty much... culture shock, or...? Oh God! You have like literally like when George Lucas like would walk in the room and like I'm he's telling me what to do over my monitor. I'm just like I'm kind of looking over my shoulders like is anyone <laughs> like seeing this? This is insane! <laughs> I'm like this is like my dream come true. I'm like and I'm melting like at the same time trying to like digest the notes he's saying, but like at the same time I'm just like flattered and blown away and like oh my God! But like I was really really uh, very focused. You know it's. Everything they wanted me to do, I would do ten times over until they would tell me to stop. You know, I just mm-hmm. and you know, it's all I wanted to do was make this perfect for his vision. You know, and that's what we do for as a company. You know, we make directors' visions as best we can and as quick as we can. And the evolution of like what that was then, like using Maya and just regular viewport with like crappy textures, and now we're using uh, Unreal Engine and we're it's like beautiful, amazing ambient occlusion with like volumetric lighting and like these gorgeous models that we get from like the final VFX vendors that just look crazy. And up front, our, we're starting to hit a place where our previs is starting to hit final. And it is 
crazy. And we joked about it like years ago, like 10 years ago. It was like, George would be like, oh, that looks great. Just final it. And then we would kind of laugh. But <laughs> now we're actually looking at the shots that we're doing. And it's like, well, it almost looks final. And everyone kind of looks around the room and is like, can we final this? I'm like, no, it's not log. We, we, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, have there ever been those moments where you've thought about, because I'm sure you have, like, what if we created a small little division specifically to kind of say, hey, well, we've done all the heavy lifting. So why don't we just, you know, take this piece of the the sequence and finish it ourselves yeah we're already kind of doing that yeah okay <laughs> on projects that i can't speak of yet but yeah mm -hmm. i mean it makes total sense because again you you've done all the work so yeah you know it's having there. that disconnect to shift it to someone else it, it's more probably cost effective to keep it in-house anyway yeah absolutely i mean we we lay the framework and there's i mean in every show that we do we basically hand over the blueprint and it's like yeah. here it is um, we just finished, you know, I finished Pacific Rim, uh, uh, you know, it just came out and I, you know, I even put on the mocap suit and I walked around and I was, I was gypsy and then we finished it. We finished the sequence and we sent it to, uh, be finaled and mm -hmm. I, we, I did frame by frame A and B and I was like, dude, that's my motion capture on the screen. Wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. It like, translates. And so, you know, they don't tell you what they delete or what they edit, but you can see it, you know, it's pretty awesome. Like we have to add one pixel and <laughs> take ownership yeah, of the shot. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. And like, how long did you stick around for, was it just specifically for, uh, attack of the clones or were there other um, projects? No, you know, it's funny. Um, I built a really good, it, the great thing about, you know, the whole Lucasfilm team is there. It, and it's kind of what we carried on to the Halon team is like, it's a big family sort of culture that, you know, everyone just really respects each other. It's happy. It's like, you don't get into a production where everyone's like kind of, you know, you kind of get in some production where people are like hasty and angry and like, eh. And like, we always try to keep it cool and mellow and everyone happy. And, you know, that's what it was on Star Wars. And it was awesome. And that's what we translate to our film. And then in when we were in Star Wars um, on episode two, we finished episode two. And then there was a lull. And we knew George was going to do three. And it's like, what are we going to do in between? Mm -hmm. And so George watched THX 1138 in between two films. And he was like, we have to do some stuff to THX 1138. <laughs> and I was like, sweet. Great. So we actually planned out like, I know, I think it was like 200, 300 visual effect shots. Went to ILM. Like all of the previous artists basically put on like THX. We shaved our heads. We had a whole thing where we <laughs> shaved our heads. And we like were extras and like all the backup stuff. And we did, uh, you know, all the visual effects for the redo of THX 1138. That kind of bridged us into episode three. And then when we finished episode three, um, you know, Dan Gregoire, my business partner and I, uh, we went to work with Steven Spielberg. And Spielberg helped us a lot to get started uh, on War of the Worlds. And so we did a lot of work with him. And that's kind of where we just started open shop. And that mm. was on a Broadway, Santa Monica. That that's was, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's really great. And War of the Worlds like, got a lot of attention for the previous, just, you know, because I think uh, Spielberg just kind of gave a lot of praise to just being one of those movies where he started to rely oh, on previous. Oh my gosh. I have the best story ever. So, like, I get in there and he starts, he's like, we need to do an airplane crash. And he drew this thing. It wasn't, it wasn't even a napkin. It was like a sticky note. And he drew this thing. <laughs> I collect now, those, by the way. Whenever a director's like, give me like a stick yeah. figure and a sticky note, I'm like, this yeah. to final. Like, <laughs> Totally. And I was like, all right, give me this. So then I took this 747 model. I broke it apart and I structured it. And then I put like a 16 by 9 frame on it. And I was like, all right, let's lens it. Let's get a good composition. And I was like, is this what you're thinking? He was like, yes. So two weeks later, we're driving into the lot. There was a 747 ripped in half on two trailer park beds. Wow. And I, our, our two trailers. And I was like, are you kidding me? This can't be what I drew, what he drew, what I made. Oh, my God. So then, like, probably, like, two or three weeks later, he's like, yo, go on up to uh, lot three and check out what's up there. I, we walk up there, and it's exactly this huge mega structure airplane ripped in half exactly as I model it straight from his notepad. Like it was, yeah, <laughs> it was insane. It was insane. That's so awesome. Kind of seeing like that come to reality in, in such a way. It's so, so cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually one of my buddies, like I think now in joiner, like he, um, we still work together at blur. Now he's been a, I think at legend for a long time. Um, I was getting mixed up. Um, but yeah, he's, 
like he was working Pacific Rim, like building life size or close to life size, like you know, uh, robots and doing all that stuff. And for him, yeah. that was where you know he found it so enjoyable was like instead of doing everything in 3D, where it's like, okay, cool, now I get to see it on the big screen. He was actually getting to see yeah. his designs, you know, right. coming out to be real, where you could touch them, and you know, it's just oh, a whole other tactile. reality. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really cool. And for you, like, I guess. You know, I think that anyone who's ever ran a business like or created a business, uh, there's always going to be that. Hopefully, there's going to be that moment of hesitation in the beginning. It's kind of scary when you get people are like, nope, going to do this. There is. Uh, <laughs> there is, you know, and I, I oh, like I think I owe my grandfather like the, the biggest credit to everything because in high school, like all I ever wanted was a computer. And like he was the one that gave me a computer. And when I got out of the Air Force and I told everyone what I wanted to do, I'm like, I want to make movies and I want to do art with computers. Everyone's like, what are you talking about? And like if I could give any message to anyone listening to this ever, follow your heart and don't let anyone ever tell you you cannot do something because you can do anything you want to, mm -hmm. anything. And, you know, it's like the biggest message I could ever try and get across. Yeah. Oh, I think it's critical. I think that you got to have a plan. And that's the scary yeah. thing is I have seen the opposite direction where people kind of naively pursue something without yeah. really realistically grounding it. But I, right. I think that, that that's it, knowing that, okay, if anything was possible, how would I do it? And most because right. most people are either going to themselves or people around them are going to say that that's not achievable. You know, give up, go do go join the Air Force. And, um, yeah. <laughs> but then, but if it was possible, how would you do it? And I think that as soon as you kind of get into that mindset, it's like, well, okay, how would I do it? And then you can kind of break it down into achievable goals. Yeah. You have to have structure. And I think one of the benefits that I had is I studied my craft before I went to school for the craft. And that gave me so much backup knowledge for it, which was a huge advantage. And like, you know, if I could do it all over again, and I had the knowledge that I have today, especially like, even if I wanted to be a doctor, I would study physiology. I would study like psychology. I would study, you know, f body physics before I went to med school, just so I would have a little bit of an edge. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And that's yeah. exactly what I did. But I didn't realize I was doing it when I went. I just went and did it because I love it so much. And it just ended up working out, you know. And I think that's the uh, that's the that's passion, you know. That's it's that inspiration, you know. It's what drives you. Well, that's great. That's really cool. And I think it's really great advice as well. And with Halo, and, like you guys also worked at Lightstorm for a little bit too. Is that correct? Oh or... yeah, I uh, I CG supervised Avatar for four years with Jim. Yeah, I love the casual like oh, I just CG supervised Avatar. <laughs> you know, like, actually the first time I saw Avatar, I've mentioned it a dozen times on the podcast just because um I thought I think it is so cool. But yeah, I actually got to see it in Lucas's um, home theater at the at the okay. ranch. So the I thought that was really stack, cool. The stack theater. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but um. But yeah, I mean, you know, again, such a, a massive epic film. Like, how did that come to be? Oh, my gosh. that will, So after we finished doing War of the Worlds, we had done like uh, we did X-Men and a couple of other projects. And Dan was like, hey, I set you up for the interview. You got to go over and talk to Brooke Breton. I was like, I don't know any of these people. <laughs> so I walk into this room. I have no idea where I'm at in this huge building. And I'm like, all right, now I got to sit and interview with this lady. And I'm like, I don't even know what building this is. I'm like, what is going on? It was Lightstorm Entertainment, and I was sitting there, and Brooke is like, so tell me about everything you've done, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, so I've done this and that. And she's like, all right, cool. So I want to get you to preview as a sequence for us as a test. So they literally threw like 60 storyboards at me. I was the only person on it for like a week and a half, and I did the entire sequence by myself in my wow. – just animated everything. There was no motion capture, so it looked – it looked, it looked terrible. You could imagine trying to animate that much in like such a short amount of time. But like I had the things down and like I had the camera angles down and I was able to tell the story enough to where Jim was like, this is funny. This is good. So cool. then so they were then like, right, so we want to pull you into this motion capture sort of realm. And so I was like, all right, cool. Never really worked with it. And so we started getting I started to get used to motion builder. And I'm like, by the way, I've got some artists that i want to bring on in my company that i think could help out so i started pulling people in and they kind of pulled people from elsewhere and we i mean it was awesome everyone got along there wasn't any like company politics which sometimes is really annoying and then uh you know everyone just worked together as a family you know and, and that's one of the I, I can't like i can't urge that enough especially in our industry is like when it comes to production everyone needs to have that sort of bond where it's like everyone understands each other and it's like chill and you can't pressure too much because if you do it's the work's not going to come out as good you know what i mean there's right there's there's a limit to everything but just keep it cool you know? 
<laughs> but anyway, back to Avatar. We did it, and then you know the team grew and it kept growing, and then I ended up like supervising everyone and I was doing Excel sheets like every other day and my job started to turn from creative into uh, very logistical left brain stuff and then they finally gave me uh, Helen Jen who was like one of the best coordinators ever and then she was like "All right, I'm going to take care of all the shit that you hate now go be creative (laughs) (laughs) so I went I love those partnerships yeah I know (laughs) So that's kind of like where that went. And we, you know, made the film and after Avatar, like, you know, I made a lot of really good contacts uh, uh, on the film. And a lot of the guys came and they worked for Halon for a while. And, you know, we lost a few of them back to Avatar 2 and 3. But, hey, it's all good. It's good to see him shine, you know. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. That's really cool. Um, And jumping back to Halon, like, so initially starting up, because we keep jumping on this, but uh, segueing off. But, like, um, in the beginning, I'm like, how did that, like, kind of get going like was there a lot of traction from the beginning or again like kind of getting a getting that growth and getting that momentum like for you what was the experience like in the beginning i think for us it was basically you know we knew that we could do this for star wars and for dan and i and i i mean any kid eight years old (laughs) star wars is like the conglomerate of sci-fi it is the Mm -hmm. thing you know it is everything everyone wants to make if you're like an artist you know and so for us like we did that it was like dude we just did that and it was like let's do this for other films let's do this for everything we can like every film out there we can make i mean not only star wars like like we know how to set up composition for a sequence and tell a story and make it look really good and we can tell any tone we want we can make it intense we can make it happy we can make it sad we know how to tell a story so let's convey that to every type of film we can. And so that's what we did. And we put our stakes in the ground and, you know, like I said, Steven helped us out a lot getting us started on more of the worlds. And after we did that and being in Hollywood, you know, we, we met a lot of people and we just started networking and, you know, one thing led to another and it was just, it, now it's film after film. Now we have like six films going at the same time. That's awesome. That's so cool. And for you, like what's the attraction to previs? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, having the the close uh, relationship with the director, you know, because I, I think that like post production, there is a big disconnect because you are yeah. a service. Oh, yeah. You know, you're coming into, you know, someone says, "Hey, go make an explosion." You go make the explosion. Yeah. You're not really telling a story, but like, do you find yeah, exactly. that with previs, you actually get to have some influence in the film and get a relationship with the director? Yes, and but it is different. But it's also we are a service company, so it it goes different ways. Like you know, we'll have a project where. We won't even interface with the director, and they'll just be like, "Here's the boards, make it a previs, and then be done with it." And we won't even, you know, we'll get like three notes and be like, "Thank you," but then there are the projects where we, the director is right next to us, and he's like, "Here's my vision," and the director is there every day, and we're just doing it with him, and we're making it, and you know, we'll animate everything, play blast, or now we're rendering in Unreal, and we'll edit it, and we've got a story, and it's like, "Oh, cool! Now I can pitch it to the studio." <laughs> it's That's like great. Wow. <laughs> So it, it runs the gamut, you know, it, it goes both ways. That's cool. You know, we, do, we do commercials, which, you know, those are short and those are usually the ones that are, you know, they're a little, you know, those are the ones we don't get a lot of interaction with director, but the films, especially like the big ones we're working on now, it's, we get a lot of director interaction. And for me, like being in a previs and the reason I wanted to, like the reason I've stayed in previs all my life is just having that creative decision with him mm. or with them, with the directors. Um, I find often like working with the directors that we do, uh, they give us as, you know, at Halon artists and supervisors a lot of say and like what happens and what, we, you know, they're like, what do you think of this? And then, you know, we have the opportunity to be like, what if I add this shot here? And, you know, and what if we do this epic moment here? And a lot of the times they're like, yeah, that's great. Cool. And it's like, you know, when you go to see it on the big screen and then you see your idea and you're like, okay, yeah. that was my idea. And then my eye starts to water and I start to cry. It's kind of like, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> that's great. No, that's really awesome though. I mean, and that's, that's exactly it. Like you've, you've got a chance to really put in your ideas and sometimes yeah. of, of course they're going to say yes and other times they're going to say no but um but yeah i mean that's that's so amazing and just to put you on the hot seat um how do you think that halo and stands out from let's say some of the competitors you guys have like you know are there certain strengths that you guys play on or, or certain technology like what, for you what do you think is some of the things that you guys bring that uh, makes you stand out from everyone else i think we are more of a family cultured company 
we're not as much of a revolving door that fires and hires and kicks people out and ingests only on needs. Um, we try, uh, especially in my company, to, you know, when we have really good artists and people that work great, we, you know, I, we, I just try to keep everyone on shows. You know, we have multiple shows going on, and I always just try to keep people going. You know, it's, you know, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's, I don't know, for me personally, I, I care a lot about people. I hate politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, business is business and you got to deal with it. But, you know, for me, I'm just, I'm, I'm a cultured family guy. You know, I just, I like people. I want people to be comfortable and I, I want to keep them around, especially, you know, when they're happy doing what they love to do. That's great. That's cool, man. That's really awesome. Um, yeah. Like in general, I think that, you know, the work you guys are doing is, is fucking awesome. So I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> fan. And just to talk about Unreal for a second, I mean, again, just yeah. tools in general. Um, there's a couple of questions I have, but like, um, yeah, like what do you think are like the main tool sets that you guys use these days? Obviously Maya, obviously Unreal, and also yeah. like the transition from doing Play Blasts to working Unreal. Like I'd love to kind of hear a bit about oh, how man. real-time rendering <laughs> and the interactiveness kind of plays off. Don't get me started. Oh my God. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like, all right, so when, before Viewport 2, point, or whatever, Viewport 2.0 came out with uh, Autodesk, which is a nightmare. Actually, which... can I really interrupt for one second to say like, yeah. um, and this might be exactly what you're explaining, but I, I love to how in, especially Maya, uh, like one and two, you'd run a play blast and then you'd walk away and the screensaver would kick on. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and it took him like so many versions to fix that. So suddenly it's like a star field simulation or whatever your screensaver was, oh, would just, yeah. you know, if you didn't catch it, you'd send it to the client. It's like, no. <laughs> been there, been there, done that. So the evolution of actually getting your vision on screen from Maya, uh, you know, Maya before Viewport 2 came out, um, it, I thought I thought it was fluid, it was efficient, it was dirty, you know, it didn't look great, it got your vision across, but you know, you hit Play Blast in Viewport 1 and it was done, and there's your, there's your thing, you know, it's mm. great. Viewport 2 came out, so everyone's like, alright, we need fucking ambient occlusion, we need all this other stuff, and let's let's start coding all sorts of other crap to get in there so that we can crash your video card with texture overload <laughs> and then you can't fucking play blast anything. So finally it was like, all right, we are like, we had scenes with so much geometry and textures loaded into viewport two. We were trying to cram in for our films. I mean, we're working on feature films. I mean, there are epic sets that we're trying to like tell a story with. And you know, Maya's choking on it and it's like, all right, kill. now we can't even play blast this. Uh, here comes unreal which is fantastic the pipeline and the you know the way to work into unreal is very intricate there's a lot of different ways you can go into unreal and it took us a long time and we still like on each show work a little differently to get out of maya into unreal to make it look good but the benefit to unreal is once you have everything set up in unreal you know it takes a lot of front loading but once you're done it looks freaking gorgeous it's real time it plays quick you don't have any hassles and it, you know, it just, it looks solid in the end. So, I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's my start to finish of video <laughs> card anger. <laughs> so what was the transition like going into Unreal? Like, did you, was there any specific reason like, Hey, like, let's just try this out. Or did you kind of see something and say, okay, yeah, like this is the future. We got to jump on well, this. Us as a company, you know, we, you know, we always want to make our images look amazing. We want to make, you know, what we show, I, I want my clients to say, holy fuck, that looks amazing. And so with Viewport 1, it's like, well, it, it looks pretty shitty. It's like, you know, if back in the day, if you did it right, and you spent some time in Viewport 1, and you, you know, baked all your color, your vertex colors, or you went nuts with it, you know, you could make it look good. But with Unreal, you don't have to. And so it's kind of, you know, it's weird, you know, it's, I have a love and hate for it. So it's, <laughs> it doesn't have the speed. Like doing Unreal stuff is a little slower, but mm-hmm. back in the day when it was just Viewport One and we're play blasting free, oh my god, we would I could do like 20, <laughs> 15 shots a day, you know, it was crazy. That's cool. Um, and what about other tools? Like, are there any other specific tools that you guys tend to rely on for your productions? Oh man, we constant we're constantly evolving. It's crazy. Like, you know, when we started, we had no mo capture, you know, and then now we built a small volume. Now our volume is a little bit bigger and we got some fancier cameras. And now we, our motion is actually we're giving to vendors in their Pacific Rim. They're actually using it. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's crazy. I think motion capture is an amazing uh, tool. I think uh, along with video game engines, uh, I think I, we're like I said, we're on the cusp of video game engines 
starting to final things. And I think we're also on the cusp of uh, like facial capture being put into that at the same time. Wow. And I don't think the facial capture is, you know, facial capture with uh, body capture, syncing and everything, you know, it all takes some processing, but I don't, it, I don't think it's there yet, but I think, you know, give it like five more years. I mean, think about 10 years ago. Yeah. Do you think like, w- it's you so know- disconnected. You would have like, let's say a famous rig or something similar to that where you're doing facial expressions and then you're doing the mocap and then you're animating like the hands and, and yeah, everything else, totally you know, crazy. And that's like during the old IRC days, like mm-hmm. the one thing I big, like that I studied and like the one thing I had a passion for was character. I just wanted to learn how to rig a character and do like muscle systems because ILM was like my, I was like, Oh my God, ILM, how do they do this? You know? So I tried to learn all of this and I did and it was crazy. And then I started to get like into particle physics and like dynamics and effects and then that's when I like came across you and I was like, dude, this guy is the bomb. <laughs> he like, he's like the fume guru. And, uh, <laughs> like, no, and then I found out you worked on destiny. I was like, all right, it's like my favorite video game ever. So yeah. <laughs> I still haven't played it. I was, I was chatting with, um, another guy is like right down the road from you, uh, Entropic, one of the art directors there. And, um, I caught up with him when I was in LA and yeah, I was like, I guess he plays a lot of destiny. I was like, is it a good game? I've, I've never had a oh, chance man. to play it, but. Yeah, I played it all morning. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I got a Jade Rabbit, and I got the uh, yeah. You don't want to know anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to like RSC, I mean, do you remember Jesse Hayes at all? Oh yeah, El Jesse. Uh, yeah, because like uh, Gio Napkel, who's obviously like one of the lead modelers at ILM, like modeling soups. He's he's amazing. Um, but yeah, like yeah. Jesse, yeah, it's just like I, I was actually talking with um, uh, Terrell. I can't remember her last name. Um, anyway, like one of the like the woman who invented uh, Sebulba or whatever from Phantom Menace. Yeah. yeah uh-huh. And she also designed Jar Jar and a bunch of other characters. And, and I just remember like Jesse, like he was creating a lot of these characters in Max and Nendo, like N world and all that back in the day as well. Yeah. Like just these phenomenal characters that were feature film quality when, you know, everyone else is kind of extruding boxes and <laughs> using mesh smooth and all this kind right. of basic stuff. So, I mean, yeah, it's just kind of phenomenal to kind of see like all these people and kind of their career paths and initially having yeah. that community and just where everyone went, you know? Yeah. I stayed, pa- I stayed in touch with him for a while and I think he was in like uh, Northern California doing like yeah. a game thing. And then uh, now he's just, he's building like <laughs> full effects. And I think he built a full on R2D2 or something. So. Uh, yeah. I've, I've got him on Instagram and um <laughs> Yeah, it's just funny because I, I assume he still has his company. I'm not sure, but like maybe that makes sense because like, I'm like, wow, like where do you find time? Because he's he's just showing all these knives that he has, and then he's like using like a CNC machine to make like weird metal things. And yeah, I've got no idea what the hell he's doing. So yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, and again, like it's just kind of interesting to kind of see. You know, I think it's like a valuable lesson with networking. You kind of stay in touch with all these people and just kind of you never know where one person's going to end up and how you all end up working together or chatting 20 years later on skype i, um, still, I can't believe your machete that is so <laughs> wild dude oh my god dude whenever you come to la we have to go out for a beer yeah absolutely i mean that's the funny thing is i used to live like a couple of blocks from your office so uh yeah, yeah. I'm going to be back down. I'm going to shoot, I think, in June. So, um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll definitely swing by. I want to check out your office because it sounds pretty yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with uh, a huge facility right now and a pretty big client. Um, and I could probably give you a little tour there as well. So, yeah, yeah you're welcome. Uh, either way, I think having a few beers would be pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, it okay. should be fun. Cool. Well, <laughs> we can wrap things up and I'll let you get back to your family because I know today's Mother's Day. So, uh, okay. um should probably spend some time with them but i mean yeah just in general i, I think it's been really awesome one question i did have was vr because i i have a yeah. sneaking suspicion you've probably been messing around with that a lot yeah yeah you know we're using some vr tools to help uh you know our directors see their vision you know it's it's kind of interesting because you know i've worked with directors that really embrace technology um and then i've worked with directors you know i worked on life of pi with ang lee and i traveled cool. the world with them and uh, we, you know, we, I was doing previs on the plane going to India <laughs> and like, you know, it was awesome. They treat, they treated us so well. It was amazing. Uh, you know, the producer was just super awesome. Um, but like anytime that I brought up like the idea of like motion capture or virtual camera or it, he was like, no, 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 no. They, they, he didn't want anything to do with it. He was like, no, no way. Probably because um, of Hulk. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you remember those videos something. of seeing him like stomping around. In the you know suit. It's him in the suit, it, like yeah. when he's like next to the tank, it was like the most badass shot of the whole. <laughs> I was angry, 
But uh, but yeah, he was like, eh, you know, he likes to keep it simple, you know, and I think that that is valuable and I think that has its place. And I think keeping things simple without bombarding it with so much technology sometimes gets us the story out quicker. But I also think directors that need and want that technology to see that vision, it helps them as well. So, you know, it goes both ways. You know, us, we, you know, I have my own little side projects that I, you know, work in Unreal with and I have my little, you know, Oculus, you know, little first kit that came out mm-hmm. that I kickstarted, you know, and it's, you know, I mess around with that, but yeah, I don't know. Personally, when I get off of work after looking at computers all day, I don't really look at them when I get off. So you, you look at Destiny instead. I pretty much look at Destiny. <laughs> and had it before. I, I'm a, I love to cook, so I'm a chef as well. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, yeah, man, I, this has been fucking awesome. So uh, yeah, I, you know, again, thank you for taking the time to chat, and we definitely gotta yeah. get some beers when I'm in town. Yeah, man, dude. Like seriously, I, uh, I was completely in shock when my producer Patrice said that you had messaged us and wanted to chat. Because I was like, dude, that guy's fucking awesome. And like I said, I had no idea that you're like Machete from fucking IRC. <laughs> it's like such a small world. It's so cool. Like, I'm like, I'm so stoked. I'm just like super happy right now. It's like really cool. It's like full circle happy. It is, man. I, well, I'll just add on that and say like, you know, I, I think it's funny back then because I think we're all in different places in our lives, obviously. And for me, yeah, I was... You know, I was the little kid. I was like 14, I think, on IRC for the longest time, like, you know, dicking around particles and doing all this stuff. And, you know, I'm in Australia. The internet is still relatively new. And, you know, we're we're all connected. But at the same time, we're all completely, uh, there would be no way that we would have all that connection if it wasn't for that. And then suddenly you're right. Like, you you fast forward. Sorry. What part of what part of Australia uh, were you from? Uh, Brisbane. So just up north from Sydney. So it's the second biggest, third biggest city in in Australia. in between X Men and us actually landing Avatar, I was actually uh, through Halon. I, we worked on Ghost Rider in Melbourne, so I got to live in Melbourne for like. So Ghost Rider two or one? The first one. Oh, so <laughs> I, I didn't know they shot that in Melbourne because. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was at, like like the, the studios were fresh, like right when they built them, and uh, we got to stay on St Kilda and. Oh uh, man, St Kilda! Like, yeah, whenever uh, people ask like where to go, because I didn't realize uh, until yesterday, Melbourne's number one city in the world right now, and St Kilda is right. like. If if I ever have people ask like where to stay, I'm always like St. Kilda, you know, go to the beach. Yeah. Watch out for syringes in the sand, but besides that, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or the flies at the beach, but otherwise, oh my, I had so much a good time there. It was so good. That's great. Well, oh, and we'll we'll wrap it there, by the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, this has been fucking cool, man. So uh, yeah, yeah, for real. Dude. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely let you know when this episode's coming out, and um, when Thanks, I am. Dude. When I am coming to LA, I'll give you guys a heads up, and yeah, I'm sure we can get some drinks around town. That would be fantastic, man! And, and it's super, super cool to reconnect with you. I mean, like, like I said, full circle, man. It's like, yeah, it's super cool. I'm just like all smiles right now. It's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Like, no, honestly, it's, it's been really great chatting. So, um, yeah, yeah likewise. It's... Hey, man, you got my number. Like, text anytime, man. You're a friend as far as I'm concerned. So. <laughs> it, it's funny that like there, there's definitely been a few episodes where I'm just like, all right, like I'm, I'm best friends with someone now. I've hung up the phone. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely <laughs> st- uh, stay in touch, man, for sure. Rock on, dude. Uh, to, I guess I'll catch you later. I'm going to go cook a steak and lobster for my mom. So that Sounds great, man. All right, well, have a good one. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hit you up soon. You too, brother. Have a good, good night. You too. Bye. Yeah, bye. All right, I want to thank Brad for taking the time out to chat. I had a blast and it was really cool to realize how much of a small world it is. Um, and hopefully I'll get to catch up with Brad in person when I get back to LA in a couple of weeks time. Now, next episode is going to be with Kathleen Ruffalo from Framestore. She's the crew manager for LA as well as for Chicago. And she talks a lot about Framestore and a lot of the culture there. If you want to work at Framestore, this is the episode to listen to. Kathleen gets into a lot of detail about not only what they look for, what they don't look for, and everything else that is Framestore. So keep an eye out for that episode. I'll be back next week. If you want to check out the show notes, go to alanmckay.com slash 145 for episode 145. Also, if you're attending Comic-Con this year, make sure to say hi to Brad. Again, we'll leave information in the show notes for all this stuff. Okay, so that's it for now. I'll be back next episode. Make sure to get the free training that's available till the end of the week at almckay.com slash plasma, P-L-A-S-M-A. 
And of course, this uh, training is only available till June 24th, but there will be other training that you can sign up for. So if it's past this date, then you can always still sign up and there'll be other stuff coming up very shortly. Okay, so that is it for now. I'll be back next episode. Rock on.